All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the show. Today, we've got Gigi Fernandez on. Gigi, welcome. Well, thank you for having me, Will. Yeah, this will be a lot of fun. Um, and I want to dive into strategy a lot today. But before okay. we get to that, uh, I was doing some research earlier. Uh, obviously, I, I knew you were a 17-time major champion and all these accolades. But I was going through your pro career and saw from 92 to 94, you won three majors per year, and you won nine consecutive finals and only dropped a set in two of those finals, which wow. was mind-blowing to me. <laughs> I don't know if anybody's ever told you that. Not, I mean, I knew that I won six in a row, but I didn't know that we had nine consecutive finals, and I didn't know that we only dropped two sets in the finals. That's Wow, that was good, I guess. <laughs> so, so, yeah, so in three years, winning three of the four majors and then yeah. winning nine straight finals, what was your mindset like during those years? Obviously, you're the best doubles player in the world. Every time you're on the court, you've got to feel just so confident. Yeah, it was, um, you know, once we got rolling, um, Natasha and I got together right before we won our first Grand Slam, which was the French Open in 92. Um, and, you know, we won that one. I don't remember if it was easy or not, but I remember after winning Wimbledon, we thought we kind of had something pretty special going. And then, then we won the first six Grand Slams that we played, that we played which is still a record, I believe. No one's done that. Um, Mirza and Hingis got close. I think they won the first four that they played. Um, but it was, I mean, it's a really nice feeling to walk on the court knowing that you don't have to do anything special to win, but you just have to play your game. And if you play your game, you're going to win. Um, and then also we had this mental edge over everybody because we got in a, and we got, we would get in, in a, I guess you'd call it a habit. It's a bad habit, but we'd get down in matches. Um, and we just wouldn't lose. I mean, we, we were down a lot. You know, I think you said we only lost two sets in the finals, but we struggled. I, we struggled during Grand Slams. Like, at some point in the Grand Slam, we would be down a set in a break or match points. It wasn't all smooth sailing, but we just always found a way to win these matches where we were just on the brink of defeat. And so then people started to feel the same way. It's like, oh, well, they're down a set in a break, but they're, they're going to come back and, you know, they're going to end up winning. So it was like a self-fulfilling prophecy. We thought we were going to win. They thought they couldn't win. So... <laughs> Yeah, you know, oh. and I think yeah. So it was pretty fun. We have, we won Natasha and I won fourteen Grand Sons in five years, so that was that was a pretty fun incredible. time. Yeah, that's incredible. Yeah, so it sounds like some of the opponents you'd step on the court and you knew you could play your own game, and the opponents were the ones that had to take more risk and adjust, right? And things like that. Exactly. They they'd have to come up with some special strategy to beat us because if we just played normal tennis and we were, if they played their best and we played our best, we were going to win. Right. So they, they were the ones right. that had to take, take risks. Right. That's amazing. So uh, what, what do you tell people when they ask what, it, what you're doing now? Like, what do you do? Oh, a lot. So um, G friend is tennis. Um, does three main things. I have online products, um, doubles, the GG method online is online and it's basically everything I know about doubles in a video program. Uh, I also have a mental toughness product, a volley pro, uh, program, have a subscription service. So that's kind of the online part. Uh, the second thing I do are camps and clinics. I do clinics around, travel around the country, going to clubs, doing clinics, introducing people to the Gigi Method. And then I do camps here in Tampa, uh, three-day camps at the Innisbrook Resort. And I also do them at Indian Wells, um, the U.S. Open, when those events happen again. <laughs> Yeah. And then I also, the third thing I do is uh, have a travel portion of that. So I take my followers to Grand Slams, Labor Cup, um, and other special events. So I've been doing this solely for about almost four, three years now. Um, and it was going really well until COVID hit. And COVID has been, um, a, of course, a deterrent for people to travel. So, and also for me to travel or for me to go to a club and expose you know, myself to 24 or you know 36 participants and people not wanting to be around other people. So it's been a little bit of a struggle um, yeah. for the last six months. But hopefully, you know, things will get back to normal sometime right. soon and you know, we'll go back to doing what we love. Right. Yeah, hopefully this spring the vaccine rollout goes well. Yeah. So that's what I do on that side. I'm also on the board of the um, International Tennis Hall of Fame. And I am the chairperson of something called the Hall of Famer Council, which is 
is which is um, seven past Hall of Famers. Um, we formed just formed a committee to try to get help get more con connectivity between the Hall of Famers because you know we have these ninety three living Hall of Famers and we're all pretty disjointed. You know we're not okay. we don't um, we don't have a really community around it. I mean it's like you get inducted and it's the greatest day of your of your career by far, and then you kind of go away and no one ever knows what you did. <laughs> you know there's so many if you think about how many Hall of Famers are out there that if they're not broadcasting. You never hear from them, you know, and and you know, and I'd like to know how, like for example, Sabat Gabby Sabatini's doing, or she, um, I don't know, like Moresmo, you know, a contemporary. Like, what is she up to? Like, she's not coaching right now. What is she up to? So, so we're just trying to um, get more connectivity with the whole thing. So that's a fun project. Cool. Yeah, get some events yeah. to connect everyone again. Yeah, it's awesome. Uh, and then for a little bit after. Your pro career, I think I read that you did some coaching as mm -hmm. well on the pro level. Yep, I've coached at every level. And why, did that, <laughs> why did that kind of uh, slow down? or why, why uh, Yeah, that yeah good question. So, so my journey into coaching really started pretty much right when I retired. I started coaching the Puerto Rican Fed Cup team um, and went to – of course, Fed Cup with them. I went to the Pan Am Games with a couple, with a, as the coach of the Puerto Rican – team at men and women. Um, then I started, um, then I became a coach at University of South Florida Division One here in Tampa. Um, and I did that for about four years. And then I got frustrated with the recruiting process because I kept recruiting people that I thought would be really good college players, but they all wanted to turn pro. And none of the, not one girl that I tried to recruit that turned down my scholarship offer ever made it on tour you know but all the parents thought that they were going to be the next jennifer capriati you know and it was like tough. yeah and it, so it was frustrating because i just couldn't get players to to commit so i stopped doing that and then i started coaching uh lisa raymond and sam Stowe. well first renee Stubbs was the first person that i coached mm -hmm. um and uh renee and lisa were those partners so i coached them and then when they stopped playing together then i kind of paired up lisa raymond and sam Stowe's or and they won the uh, 2005 uh, U.S. Open when I was coaching them. So mm -hmm. it was kind of fun to, to coach a Grand Slam team, to kind of be on the other side. Uh, and then I be became director of tennis at Chelsea Piers in Connecticut, and I coached players from you know, three years old to, like, I had less than with an 80-year-old one. So I had um, a, a person who's, whose mom was turning 80, and she wanted to give her a tennis lesson from me. So... So I coached anything from you know three to eighty, um, and then in the end, I ended up I ended up coaching adults because I found that uh, it's what I enjoyed the most. Um, I didn't I didn't sometimes didn't want to deal with kids that didn't respect my past, you know, and they mm -hmm. you know ten year olds have no concept of what it's like to be on a court with a Hall of Famer, or Grand Slam champion, and mm -hmm. and I, and I that got a little bit tiring of that. But the adults just love being on the court with me, and they they're sponges, and they want to learn, and they want to get better. And I made a lot of friends. Um, at that time, I discovered the social side of tennis, like something that you probably take for granted. Tennis is social, but I didn't re really learn that till I was um, forty seven years old. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so. So yeah, so now you know I I kept coaching adults because that's really what fit with my schedule, and I stopped coaching. Um, I stopped traveling on tour because I became a mom. I was mom of I'm now a mom of eleven year old uh, twins, and once I became a mom, I was gonna for sure stop traveling because um, I didn't want to be away from my kids. And then the reason that I stuck with the adults was not only because I like I said I really enjoyed it, but also because adults practice and my kids are in school so like from nine to two you know i could teach adults right. and then i would go pick up my kids to school and be a mom for the rest of the day so it really fit my lifestyle yeah it makes it a lot easier yeah, yeah. It, it seems like it's uh yeah you're making a big Im impact on the adult double scene um, yeah so yeah it's been very successful um it's kind of what beyond my wildest dreams successful like i never thought i would yeah. make uh you know, I didn't think that my second career would be more successful than my first and more profitable. If you think about just from the true business perspective, sure. um, this career has already more, you know, more potential than my other one had, or definitely, Amazing. you know, I would make more money now than when I was playing. It's kind of crazy, but, yeah. uh, but it's true. So, 
Yeah, you're pretty probably lucky. like on that cusp of when prize money was starting to increase significantly. Yeah, I was right. I mean, it was pretty good. Like I, you know, I made four and a half million dollars, I think, during my career, but which sounds like a lot of money. But when you think about a life, you know, what I saved out of that, not quite half because you have so many right. expenses. And when you think about, you know, how, how long can you make that last? Not that long. You know, when you have right. extravagant lifestyle and you travel and you make a couple of bad investments. Um, so it's hard to, it's hard to live for, you know, for 50 years on $2 million. Like it's not happening. Right. right. So, so, um, so yeah, so, I mean, I had to, after the kids were born, kind of reinvent myself and I've done, I've gone through a lot of iterations of doing different things. And in the end I came back to tennis because it's really what I love and what I know and what I'm most passionate about. After I took a break, I, t- I mean, I really took a break. It sounded like when I was talking about my coaching path, it sounded like I really never left the game, but I was very reluctant and, um, very, uh, sort of apathetic about being in tennis because when I retired, I wanted nothing to do with tennis. I was burnt out and I wanted to be anything other than G. Fernandez, a tennis player. So I spent a lot of years trying to create a new identity. And after 15 years of failing at that, then I decided, okay, I'm going to go back to what I love, which is tennis. And, uh, you know, I've, I've had long enough break that I, um, f- you know, felt the passion for it again. So I just yeah. embraced, embraced what I know and, and it's been a wonderful journey. Yeah, I'm sure finding that social side of it helps a lot too. Yeah, I mean, I've made so many friends on the tennis yeah, court so and that was fun. so different than my <laughs> my path, you know, where you're, anybody that was around the tennis courts was your enemy, you know, was your, yeah. <laughs> the person you wanted to like break their ankles so they wouldn't show up on the court, you know, kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. So it's very different. So, so now you've got uh, all this stuff going on online. Earlier today, I was on your site. Uh, I think it's ggfernandeztennis.com. Correct. Um, I'll link to it in the show notes for everyone. And right there on the site, you can test your doubles IQ with a quiz. Did you take it? I took, I scored Uh-oh. a 75%. Oh, what you miss? 75 out of 100. I'm going to look um, it up. One of the ones I missed was a if you have a player you're serving in the ad court your partner has a weak backhand volley and the opponent keeps attacking their backhand volley i think i put to put them in the i formation or australian formation and have them stay so that they have a forehand volley in the middle but you actually said to bring the partner back and put them back to the baseline left. yes you said put it to their left so both players are on the ad court so talk that's a little a, bit about that. I've never used or even heard of that formation. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Actually, I did. I I used this with. Um, I was coaching Connecticut, a Darien High School Connecticut team. You know, a high school team like not pro level, right? So when you the higher the level, the, the least weaknesses that you have. But when you're coaching high school players, that weaknesses can be pretty pronounced. So I had a player who had a pretty weak backhand volley. Like she, she would just kind of chop down on it and the ball goes straight up. So if I did eye formation or Australia, they would just return to her and, or, and would find her backhand volley. So what I would do is I would, I would put her, literally she would stand in the alley of the cross court alley, right? So to the left of the server and then the server would stand kind of in the middle, but not, not quite on the tee because what I wanted was for the girl serving to hit the next ball. So wherever the ball came on the next ball, she would hit. And then as she's hitting that ball, then the person with the weak back and volley would run to the net. And now she would have a forehand volley in the middle and she could poach for that. And we, it first of all, throws people off. Half the people, when you do this, three quarters of the people are going to tell you that's illegal, that you cannot stand back there. <laughs> but it is, it, it is perfectly legal. It doesn't matter where you stand. Um, and it's a good strategy. You know, it's like if you have a, weak, a weakness at the net, you just completely hit it. You, you took the weakness away. You put it back where it was not a weakness anymore. Okay. What else did you miss? Uh, I'm not sure the other ones I missed. I think uh, yeah, the, the, there was one that was like all of the above, and I, I had selected my favorite of the other three. Got it. The early ones. Yeah, one, one thing that people don't think when they're covering at the net is um, if you're playing, and of course this is audio, so it's kind of hard to explain. We don't, I can't show it. But um, if you're on the, at, if you're on the, um, if you're at the net on the do side, Right, so you're serving to the at side, and you're at the net, standing on the do side, and your opponent's at the baseline, and they're hitting a forehand. 
or what I call an inside shot. It's an inside shot, you hit it from the inside of the court and an outside shot, you hit it on the outside of the court. So on the outside, a backhand is an outside shot, a forehand is an inside shot. If somebody's hitting a forehand there, the natural shot for them to hit cross court goes into your alley. So right. it, from, you know, on tour, it doesn't happen very much because people hit the ball so hard. It's hard to hit, you know, if, if, you, hit, if you have a huge serve and somebody's stretching, they're not going to hit that cross court into your alley. They're going to be late and they're going to hit it inside out. But because um, recreational players, especially women, don't hit the ball as hard or even, you know, mm-hmm. three, five, four, men don't hit the ball as hard or don't penetrate their volleys, that forehand goes cross court into the alley quite a bit. On the, in the recreational game, so right. you kind of got to mind your outing on that one. Yeah, it's kind of like an inside out forehand that lands kind of short in the court. But it's not inside out, it's inside in. It's actually a cross court forehand, but cross court meaning it's going from the middle of, like if you stand, if you're hitting it from the T, right? Cross court goes into the alley that you're standing in, mm-hmm. with the outside player standing in. I mean, you, know, like you, show, you can see it here. So I'm talking yeah. about this shot. We'll post the video too. So. Yeah, yeah. So if somebody's hitting the ball from an inside shot, so if somebody's hitting an inside shot here, like this person has to watch this alley. Um, the cross court person is going to watch the middle, and you cannot hit inside out into here from an inside shot because your partner's in the way, right? I mean, right. if you're running around and hitting a four, a forehand, well, now, now that's an outside shot because you're standing on the outside part of the court. Okay. But if you're standing on the inside of the court, then the, you cannot hit from the inside of the court into the far alley. You hit right. your partner in the back of the head. Yeah. So, Tough one. yeah. Cool. Well, yeah, that's one I missed. And I know I missed the, the server's role, I think, was all of the above. And I had put my favorite one, which I think I put uh, make a high percentage of first serves. Yeah, all that. And you got to communicate, yeah, control the tempo of the game, communicate with your partner. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, 75 is not bad. I get 35s and 40s a lot. <laughs> <That's good to> <laughs> <hear>. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Makes me feel a little better. Yeah. So let's go. I want to go through the GG method. So okay, sure. that all over the site. Uh, we've got positioning. There's uh, five or six different things. Five steps surrounded by competition. Five steps surrounded by competition. Yeah, so the first one is positioning, yeah. I mean, so positioning, you have to know where you're standing. And people are so um, sometimes oblivious about the fact that they're in a positioning error. So, so when you're playing, if you if you are you know, on the other side of the court, your opponents are in a positioning error, then you have to attack positioning error because you can win points of positioning mistakes. Sure. Um, and what I tell players is if you break the, if you're in the center of the service box and you break the box in half and you break it into half again and you stand right in the middle and then you extend your arm and draw a circle around yourself, it's about a six foot circle. You should be inside that circle anytime you're at the net. So when you're, if you're in that circle, you're good. If you're outside that circle, bad things are going to happen. If you get too close to the net, you're going to get lobbed. If you get too close to the center uh, center line, you're leaving your whole alley open. If you get too close to the service line, you're going to get lobbed. And the only exception there is if you're anticipating lob, then you could stand outside your circle. And then if you get too close to the alley, then you committed the cardinal sin of doubles, which is you stood in your alley to cover your alley. Um, right. There's really no reason in doubles, particularly in recreational tennis, to cover the alley because it's the, most, it's the hardest shot to hit. Um, if you doubt this, you know, feed 10 balls to a person starting in the ba- standing in the baseline and see how many balls they hit that actually land inside the alley. Right. And for three O's is zero. For three, five, four O's is one. For four, five, five O's is two, maybe two, maybe, depending on the fed ball, right? So, right. so then I tell players, you just don't cover the ball that's going to go in 10% of the time. You cover the ball yeah. that's going to go in 90% of the time. So, you know, anytime you're not in your circle and you're not in the baseline, you're in a positioning error, right? So really understanding that as you travel from the baseline to the net, you, it's okay to stand in what people call singles no man's land. Like, I don't, I think it's a misconception that you shouldn't be in, in no man's land. It's okay. You actually want to hit balls from no man's land because you're taking the time away from the opponent, mm-hmm. but where you don't want to stay there and hit three balls, but you want to travel through that area from the cir- from the baseline to the circle as quickly as possible. Hopefully, it just takes you one transition shot to get into the circle. Sure. Um, so that's kind of the just the positioning, um, and then court coverage. Of course, you have to understand what is your ball and what is not your ball. And we um, there's a lot of confusion 
sometimes at the net with recreational players as to what ball they should be covering or not covering. And that's why we have a lot of what I call middle confusion. Like people don't know who gets the middle ball, if it's yours or mine. And it's a lot of crashing going on. Um, you know, and I fixed that. I fixed that coverage problem by staggering. Like when, when players are staggered, one player is slightly in front of the other and the player that's slightly in front is player also who's ever half the ball is in. So if the ball's in my half. When both players are at the net. Correct. Yeah. When both players are at the net, we have whoever's, wherever the, whatever side the ball is in, mm-hmm. that player slightly staggers forward and they get the middle, they get the middle balls. And then the person that's slightly staggered back is responsible for the lob. Their balls that go to them and also the lobs. Um, okay. Right. So, and then the other coverage misconception we talked about on the inside shots, you have to watch your alley. But generally speaking, the, if you're if the ball's in front of you, you're man, you're minding the middle. You're the aggressor. You're the one that's trying to put the ball away, and then your partner who's cross court from you is responsible for the lobs. So that's steps one and two, understanding that. Um, then three and four are. Do you want to talk more, more about, about this? Four. Let me yeah. let me ask you a couple questions on those. Sure. Yeah. So uh, positioning. The one thing you said is is people cover their alley too much. It sounds like. What what are some other common positioning and court coverage mistakes you see for that three five four oh four five level so the first one is standing too close to the alley right. um thinking that you know you're protecting your alley and when you do that you leave 85 percent of the court for your partner a very common one is for the cross court player to close so some coaches teach that the middle is the responsibility of the cross court person the problem with that is that if you're covering the middle and you're the cross court person, you have to close. You have to get really close to the net because you also have to cover the cross court, mm-hmm. right? No one else is going to go to the cross court but you. So the only way to the cover the middle and the cross court is to get close to the net. And when you do that, you leave the lob wide open and you're leaving the cross court lob open, which is a higher percentage lob to hit than the down the line lob. It has six to eight more feet to hit into than the down the line. But also because of the geometry of it, a cross court ball is going away from your partner trying to chase it as opposed to a down the line law, which is easier to chase because it's down the line. It's not running away from the court. Um, so that's a common one, the cross court person going forward. Then people standing too far back or still following the ball. You know, I, I, I don't teach follow the ball. I just think it confuses players. Um, and that's where they follow all the way into the base, into the alley. And um, so a lot of times, uh, let's say you're in a, we're two up against one, or say you return and come in or you're serving volley and people have a tendency to serve and volley and come towards the middle, um, thinking that their partner's going to get the alley, they're going to get the middle and then they leave the cross court wide open. Mm-hmm. Um, standing too far back in the, in the circle. So that it's too easy for the opponent to hit the ball to your feet. Um, another positioning error is standing uh, f- three to five feet behind the baseline. When you're at the baseline, uh, going back, letting the ball bounce and you know the further back you are the further the more time you give your opponent in doubles you're always trying to take time away from the opponent so if you're standing kind of hugging the baseline and not going back taking the ball on the rise or in the air if possible then you don't give your opponents time to get in position right yeah yeah those are all really good ones yeah one one thing that i like to tell tell my readers is a lot of these rules also kind of depend on the um, what's going on on the court, right? Because there's so many variables in doubles. So it might be the case that in one match, the team's not very good at lobbing, or maybe they just never lob. So you can close a lot harder. But maybe right. in another match, you have to cover that lob a little bit more. So it just kind of, a lot of it depends. But these are really good general rules to yeah. follow and I mean, kind of adjust as you notice different trends. Right. I mean, you always have your plan A when you go on the court. And then if that doesn't work, then you go to your plan B, right? So, so covering the court, the basic way first until you detect a tendency. You know, I tell people don't cover the alley. Don't cover your alley on an outside shot. But if you have somebody who is great at it, they pass you three times in a row with, you know, the backhand on line into the alley, right. clearly they have that shot. So then you got to cover it. Right. Um, you know, if somebody's hitting – some, and where are they hitting the ball from? It's another something that you also have to um, – kind of ju- or 
analyze to decide whether you're going to cover your alley or not. Because if somebody's standing in their service line and they're going to try to pass you, so you have, you've hit a weak volley and you have somebody coming, coming in to kill a ground stroke, the, the only two places that can hit the ball hard are down the line into your alley and through the middle. If, they, if they're going to hit across court, they can't hit a hard because it's going to go wide. So they have to like dip it, right? right. So, so in that case, you would cover your alley. So those are two exceptions to cover in the alley. The inside shot and the short balls right. are the two exceptions yeah. to cover in the alley. Not on, and people think that when somebody's standing way outside the alley, they should cover their alley. But I don't know any recreational players who can hit the ball around the net post into the alley. Yeah. <laughs> so I still I say don't cover it. It doesn't work for me. So. It's, yeah, it's not going to happen. So just let them have it. If they make it one time, it'll be lucky. If they make it three times, then you pay attention. Right. Absolutely. So, yeah, that's, that's a really good rule. Um, if you yeah. get beat three times then start to make the adjustments. Right. So next is, uh, we have positioning court coverage and then serve is the third one. Yeah. So serve and return is, yeah. So the serve, you know, there's, um, so many different things you can do to help your team hold serve. And most recreational players don't utilize all these, all the options that they have. They just simply right. serve cross court and play out the point. Um, you know, there's uh, Australian formation and I formation. And of course, I formation is for the higher levels, but Australian formation has the same benefits. And it's a simple change of, of positioning that really is the purpose of is to throw off your opponent. You know, so that mm -hmm. they have to hit down line returns once in a while. There's really six reasons you do Australian or I formation. Most people can name one, which is to make the opponent go cross court or go down the line if you have a good cross court return. You also do it if you have a poaching opponent. If, if your opponent's at the net poaching, um, if you do Australian formation, they, it's harder it's to poach down partner. the line ball. Yeah, if your return partner is poaching, mm -hmm. um, then on your first volley or on your first ground stroke, if they're poaching, then you go, if you do Australian, then you're hitting down the line. It's a lot harder to poach right. up and down the line. You do it to put your partner with their best volley, whether it's a forehand volley or backhand volley. If your partner has a best, better forehand volley and backhand volley, you do Australian and put him, uh, on the outside, right? So now they have a forehand volley poach. Right, if they're um, right-handed. If they're right-handed, correct. If they're left-handed, you would do it on the do side. Mm -hmm. um, you do it to put you, you with your best ground stroke. So if your forehand's better than your backhand and you're serving to the at, do Australian, so you go hit a forehand. Um, you do it anytime you're losing points on a cross court rally. Like if you don't serve a volley and your opponent doesn't either, and you're in a forehand to forehand rally and you're losing points because your forehand's better than your forehand, then go hit backhands, go hit yeah, backhands down the line. Right. right. And then the main reason that's five, the fifth, the sixth one, and the most important one is to disrupt your opponent's rhythm because it's your job of, as a server to always keep your opponent guessing. And if you don't mix it up, then they're not going to be guessing. Um, and of course, you know, having routines, uh, are very important communicating with your partner so they know what you're going to do, where you're serving, if you're serving, staying back or serving and coming in. It's really important, the communication between the server uh, and the service partner. So what should um, they be talking to each other about? It's really what they're attempting to do, you know, whether they're going to serve and come in, serve or stay back, if they're going to serve wide. If you're going to serve wide to in doubles, your partner needs to know because mm -hmm. the if you if you have a, any decent white serve, and your opponent's going to be late, they, they, there's a good chance they're going to hit that ball down the line. So you kind of have to be aware of that. You, you can't poach on a white ball, on a white serve rather. You can poach on white balls, but not white, on white serves is hard to poach because you you leave your whole alley open. Mm -hmm. um, so the better your opponent's return, the more important the communication between the partners is. So you'll you know you kind of all know what's what's happening. Right. So at minimum, your partner should know if you're serving and volleying or serving and staying back. And then ideally, they know whether you're serving to the forehand or the backhand or the body. So they have some idea of the ball that's coming back. Okay, got it. And then uh, we talked a little bit about formations. What do you, how do you view the server's partner's role? The server's partner's role is the main responsibility of the service partner is to help the partner hold. Like if my partner did not hold, Unless she hit two double faults from game point, uh, or even f unless she had four double faults in a row, because why did we get to game point, right? I, should, I needed to be helping her. So I always felt it was my responsibility if my partner did not hold. I was not active enough. I was not moving enough. I was not intimidating enough. I was just kind of standing there like a bump on a log, which is fairly common in doubles. The service partner not thinking that they're in the point, 
You know, when, right. in fact, on every serve that your partner hits, you should be either be faking or poaching or, you know, hopping, moving forward, doing right. something. You can't just be yeah. stationary when your partner's serving. Yeah, some kind of lateral movement. I see what I see when I go to the, these tournaments and leagues and stuff around Texas is a lot of servers, partners, at the the three, five to four, five level that we're talking about, they'll move forward and backwards well, but they don't move laterally a lot. Right. Yeah. So that goes back to the, you know, cover the alley thing, which I think a lot of times is more of a psychological thing than it is a, you know, do what's best for winning. Right. Because you people know, feel, feel like, like you let your partner down. You feel like if you got past points, right, I know, exactly. which is the, it's really the silliest thing that it's a, I don't know who, who first shared the sentiment, but I can tell you that when I was playing, if I did not get past down my alley, I was not doing my job because I actually wanted my opponent to hit the ball down my line. I was baiting them to try that low percentage shot. Yeah. You know, and then once you start faking and staying, then they're going to be completely f- like a mess. And they won't even know yeah. if you're going or staying. And, and that's the role of, that's what good doubles players do forever and ever and ever. The good doubles players, if you go through a little history of doubles, the, yeah. the good doubles players at every level were the ones that were intimidating their opponent at the net. Yeah. And um, they get passed down the line a lot. They get passed down the line. And, and, and I don't know how many times I poached and I just took off and, and the opponent would miss. They would just miss because changing the direct, you know, changing your mind on a shot mm-hmm. as the ball is coming is a very, very hard thing to do. Right. Like if you made up your mind to hit cross court and all of a sudden you see the person going and you have to change last minute to go down the line, yeah. that is a very difficult thing to do. And you know, there's data, there's data. <laughs> yeah, there's actually data um, that prove that. Um, Jim Lair did a study in the 80s with uh, Andre Agassi, Jim Courier, um, t- uh, uh, Martin Blackman, I forget who the four, maybe Dave Wheaton. Like he, he used to mm-hmm. work with all those players and he gathered data where he put targets on the court, like a, like a, like a bullseye, right? like a bullseye and then an outer ring, like the target logo, right? So if they hit the middle of the target, it was 10 points. If they hit the next level, it was five points and they hit the next okay. level. Uh, was one point. So he would say, okay, I'm going to, the pro's going to feed you ball, so you're going to hit 10 cross court forehands, and let's see how close to the target you get. And then he would count how many points they got. He said, okay, now when the ball comes, I'm going to tell you whether you're going to hit it, whether you're going to hit this one to the down the line target or the cross court target. So now the yeah. player didn't know whether it was going cross court or down the line. So then as the ball would come, he'd say, hit this one cross court, hit this one in the line. Of course, they're their accuracy went down a lot. Down. But what was even more interesting of the study for to me was that he said to them, okay, now these you're going to hit cross court, but at some point when, when some balls come, I'm going to tell you to hit this one down the line. But you're going to ignore that voice and you're going to stick to your first instinct. And when he did that, the accuracy was exactly the same. Hmm. Like they were as accurate when they didn't doubt themselves as – when they if they just went with their first instinct right. so what that tells you is if you have a doubt about what shot to hit go with your first instinct and don't change the direction or don't change the shot in the middle of of uh of the trajectory of the ball that's right cool. so that's why we poach because we know that players are going to be mm-hmm. more inconsistent uh if they try to go behind you and when you make them change their mind in the middle of the shot yeah absolutely yeah i'm gonna, I'm gonna look up that study see if i can find it and I'll include that um, in the show notes. And that's yeah. a good transition to our next, uh, the, the next topic, which is returning. Returns, yeah. So it yeah. sounds like uh, we shouldn't be changing direction on our return. What else uh, do we need? Well, there's, so there's, that when, you, when you boil it down, you have, um, you have two choices when you hit the return. You can drive the ball and you can lob the ball, right? And at the core, that's the two things you could do. Now, if you're going to drive the ball, most of the time you're going to hit cross court, but you can also hit it at the net person. And I think that's an underutilized return. Mm-hmm. You can hit, you can change the direction of the ball on a serve if it's not hard. So if you if you have a second serve, um, it's a good time to hit at the net person. Now, what you don't want to do is try to hit it into the alley because then you're cutting your your chances of making the shot. You want to keep the ball right, you know, in the center of the court as much as possible. Um, and the lob is very underutilized return in, in the recreational game. Yeah. Um, I mean, I used to constantly lob. I would lob once a game normally. I was hitting a lob and coming in. Um, and for some reason, 
people don't think the law or they don't practice it. It's, uh, it's, you know, it's a shot you have to learn to hit. Um, yeah, kind of like the bump drive law to my game over the last year. I used to never lob my returns. Yeah. And it's so effective because especially if you have a poaching opponent, because if you start lobbing, they'll stop poaching because <laughs> they have to back Absolutely. up. Yeah. So, um, so I mean, the thing with those is you have to utilize the whole court. You have to mm -hmm. try to, you know, hit as many shots as possible. But, um, so I tell players, you know, I, I do this one drill where I tell players, where we say, okay, we're going to practice return, but you can hit, there's three returns that you can hit that are not your normal return. And, the, and these are the three that we're going to practice. So the normal return is you hit cross court and you stay back, right? That's what everybody does. Hit cross court, stay back. The other three options are return and come in, drive it at the net person and lob the net person. So, so you really have four options when you return. Uh, and you should have pre-thought before the ball comes, which one you're going to do. You should have a thought, for the forehand, and you should have a thought for the backhand. If the ball comes to the forehand, I'm going to do this. If the ball comes to the backhand, I'm going to do that. It's very, very important with the returns to have these routines because, you know, with the serve, you start the point. So you're dictating. You're, just, you're not going to start serving until you're ready and you decide where you want to hit the ball. But sometimes for the return, people aren't ready um, and they don't have a plan for, for return. And you absolutely have to have the plan when you, when you return. Right. Okay, so so if I'm the returner, I need to be thinking before first and second serve. Forehand, I'm doing this. Backhand, I'm doing this. Correct. Of course, we need to be practicing those different returns as well. Right. And if and it's going to the bot, if it comes to the body, I'm going to run around and hit a forehand, or or I'm going to run around and hit a backhand. Right. Okay. And then what about the returner's partner? What should they be thinking about? The returner's partner's got a tough position. That's To me, the hardest position in doubles is that of the returner's partner. Because if you have a poaching opponent, um, you're going to be in trouble right away. So a lot of times, you know, a great strategy is to bring the returner's partner back if the returner is not returning well. And some people think that's a bad thing, to go two back. In fact, I'd much rather have two players be at the baseline uh, with two players at the end on the other side than have – one up, one back with two on the other side because the best position in doubles is two players at the net with one up, one back on the other side. And the worst position in doubles is to be in the one up, one, one back when there's two at the net. And by the best and worst positions, I mean statistically, the two at the net are going to win the majority of the points. And this is at all levels. I'm not making this up. This is a, There's plenty of data to show this. So... Um, so if you ever have, you know, if you're the returnist partner and you're feeling threatened or your partner's not returning well or you're feeling like you're not being helpful, just go back to the baseline and hit ground strokes. You know, when you're when you're two up versus two back in the recreational game, it's not clear who has the advantage. You know, in the pro tour, usually two up has the advantage over two back unless you're like in red clay and you have amazing ground strokes and you're Rafa Nadal and Roger Federer or something like that. Mm. But in the recreational game, two up versus two back, sometimes sometimes the two back have better ground strokes than the volleyers. So you can mm. so you can win a lot of points in games by playing from the baseline. Right. But what we don't want is two up against one up one back. Right. That makes sense. Yeah. And especially I'd imagine if you're the return team, you, you don't need to win you know, 50, 60% of your games to win the match, you really need to win only maybe 30 or so percent of the games. So yeah, if you when you're returning you back one, and increase your percentage, then right. sure, it seems like a great Yeah. Game. I mean, if you, if you have the mentality that if you never lose a serve, you never lose a match. If you understand that, you, if you never lose a serve, you'll never lose a match, mm -hmm. including if it goes to the tie break and you never lose your points. Right. So if you if you start to develop that mentality and start to hold serve consistently, then all you need is one break. And that's a set. And that's how the pros think. The problem with recreational players is that because they can break, because the serve is not as powerful, it's a lot easier to break. They don't treat their serves with as much importance because it's like, oh, well, I lost my serve, but I can break next time. So what's the big deal? Right. But if you can change your mentality to like, I have got to hold my serve, um, which was my mentality, because if I didn't win my serve, one break was the set more generally speaking on, on uh, when I was playing, I it's a little bit, before. yeah, it's different now. <laughs> yeah. Right. But it's different now because the returns are so big on the tour. It's different now. It's, yeah. you know, the, the returns have a bit of an advantage. The returns are bigger than the serves sometimes, but not when I was playing. And when I was playing the, the, Tennis in the 90s, 80s, 70s is more equal to like recreational tennis now, right? Mm. I mean, players 
recreational players will never have the power of pros today. Sure. It, yeah. Impossible, right? But um, so you think about how, how doubles was played, you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago, and that's how recreational players should be playing. It's, Interesting. Um, you're going to win more points at the net, period. Interesting. In fact, let me, I'll give you a stat for people who, who disagree. From the 2015 Australian Open, the, you know, the best ground strokes, the best players in the world, 2015 Australian Open, uh, from the second round to the finals, of all of those points that were played, 60% of the points ended in an error. Okay, so like, that's a high number. <laughs> like for recreational players, it's more than that. Wimbledon is 70% because it works faster. But of the 40% point, do you know the stat of the 40% points that were winners? What percentage of the points do you think were won by the net player and the baseline? So out of 40%, what percentage of the points do you think the baseliners won? And these are the best ground so the strokes was, in the world. I mean the winner was hit from the baseline? Right. So they, from the net? Correct. I would guess the majority would have to be from the net. So like 80% net, 20% baseline? Yeah, so you're a little bit off, but it, so we only have 40 points. So, but still you're off because it would be, it's 3% of the points were won by the baseliner okay. and 37% were yeah. won by the person on the net. Okay, okay so, so if so, you're... So I was saying like 30 and 10 or something, I guess. Right, you were like, you said... 20, 80, Whatever 20. 80% of 40 is, we don't have to do the math, but. Okay, yeah, good. <laughs> but yeah, so yeah, so it's a low number, like it's 3%. So if you have the best ground strokes in your league, if you have the best 4035 league or wherever you're playing, 4 0, mm -hmm. you will win, you will hit one winner out of a hundred, three winners out of a hundred from the baseline. Right. Right. So, so what's your mentality? It's like, it's not how do I win the point? is how do I set up my partner to put the ball away for me or how do I draw the error from the opponent? And that's really the mentality of, of, a, of good doubles players. It's yeah, always setting yeah, up their partner or drawing up the error or trying to draw the error. So, so that, that brings up a, a question for me. So uh, one thing I see a lot is like for that club player who knows, you know, I've got the best forehand on the court. I'm playing 3-5 and I've got a 4-0 a or a 4-5 forehand. So I'm just going to sit back here and just crush four hands and win all these matches. But a lot of people don't think about, you know, how do I get to that next level? If I'm a 3-5, how do I get to 4-0? If I'm a 4-0, how do I get to 4-5? And the answer oftentimes is not going to be sitting at the baseline and hitting your four hands, right? It might be working right. on some of these other skills. Like yeah. And it, how, how do you right. coach people for that and think about improvement? Yeah, so, you know, so that's why I have the, my cams because – in 10 hours on the court, you the wild improvement. You can have wild improvement because you really learn the game. You learn where to stand. You learn what type of percentage, what's not. You learn shot selection. You learn serve strategies, return strategies. Um, whereas, you know, if you if you worked on your forehand for 10 hours on the technique of your forehand, you'd, you'd have moderate improvement. But it takes a long time to make a, strong, a stroke better, sometimes months and years before, you know, you, you can put it, uh, you know, a new stroke into play, or you can really take advantage of developing a stroke. But in, you know, if you learn positioning, you learn the art of doubles, you know, if you truly become a student of doubles, you can start winning matches just by being more intelligent than your opponent. You know, in fact, Natasha and I were not, we, we won because we knew doubles better. We were not the better players on the court, you know, a large portion of the time, like, because in, in our generation, the number one, the top singles players played doubles. So we were playing against, you know, Martina Navratilova, Martina Hingis, Lindsay Davenport, Yana Novotna, um, Arantxa Sanchez, Vicario, Conchita Martinez, all these number, yeah. number one, two, and three singles players in the world. Yeah. But, you know, Natasha and I, who were like 15 and 30, so we're in that range, we were not better than them. We, we really were not, but right. we just understood that was better. We understood shot selection and what was high percentage, what was not, and who covered what ball. And we were really difficult to pass because we really, really understood yeah, uh, what to cover. I mean, we had good hands, but it, it was more really the understanding of the game. And that's what can kind of take you know, whoever's listening to the next level. It's become uh, a student of doubles and really understanding it better is what's going to take you to the next sure. level. So uh, I know we're kind of running a little on time. How much more time do you have? I'm good. Okay. I like so let's 15 do, more minutes, probably. 
This last one is shot selection. You've mentioned it yeah. a few times. Let's talk about that. Yeah, so I mean, really understanding high percentage shot selection and what is the likely sh shot that you should be hitting, but also mm -hmm. in terms of coverage, what is what shot should you cover that takes away the high percentage shot and gets your opponent the low percentage shot? So, you know, if we talked a little bit about, um, let's see, what's, what's a low percentage shot? Anytime you hit a ball into the alley, it's a low percentage shot. Right. Um, as far as shot selection, I tell players you just because they give you the alleys does not mean you should hit into it. Right. So you want to try to keep the ball as much as possible in the singles court. You keep your opponent hitting the ball in the singles court because you uh, kind of close the angles of the net. Um, you know, if you're at the net, if you're two up against one up one back or two up against two back, any low volleys you want to hit deep, and any high volleys you can hit at the person at the net. Um, you know, hitting lobs, you have to be careful hitting lobs when you're one up one back because if you don't hit a good lob, your partner's dead, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, and I think what those players in the professional game really get in trouble by being too creative, you know, like to try to hit different shots and they like try angles when they shouldn't and they, um, they try to mix, they redirect the ball constantly. So the ball goes cross court, they hit it down the line, cross court down the line. We get into this cross court down the line pattern where really when I was playing doubles, I hit 98% of the balls that I hit were cross court through the middle. Sure. So everything was cross court through the middle. Um, I only hit down the line when I thought I could hit a winner because if I didn't hit the winner, I was going to lose point. Mm -hmm. And it, but that, so then it's having understanding that and then having the discipline to continue to yeah. execute the right shot. Right. Um, you know, I, I tell players there's four errors, four types of errors that you make, and the acronym is PEST. You make positioning errors, you make execution errors, you make shot selection errors, and you make tactical errors. And really the only one you cannot control is execution. You never know how you're going to play on any given day, nor do Roger and Serena. They have good days and bad days. So if you can eliminate positioning errors, tactical errors, and shot selection errors, you will immediately become a better player. And, and you know, if all your points end in an execution error, you'll win a lot of matches. Right. You'll win a lot more matches than, than we're yeah, winning that now. Makes a ton of sense. So, so for shot selection, how should we be thinking about uh, offensive versus defensive, I guess? Yeah, so, yeah so, I, so I separate shot selection by the formations of the court. There's three possible formations that we have. You can be two up, you can be two back, or you can be one up, one back. You and your team and your opponents are always in one of these formations. And depending on where, where you are in that formation, then there's high percentage shot selection. So if we start out, let's do like the three basic ones. If, if both players are one up, one back, what are you trying to do? You want to keep the ball cross score. You want to keep it in the single score. If you hit wide, your partner can help you. But ideally, you're trying to come in because whoever comes in first puts their team in the best position in doubles, which is two up, and puts their opponent in the worst, which is one up, one back when there's two at the net. Um, so if you get that two up, one, I guess one up, one back position, the any, vo any volley that you get, if you're the two up, goes back to the baseline or there's no need to change the direction of the ball here unless you get a high ball. If you get a high ball, you're going to take that to the net player. Um, the, the net person there in that one-up position, if they can somehow get back, that's preferable. Or if the baseliner can somehow come in um, and then we're two up, two up. When we're two up, two up, really no one has the advantage. You, the goal there is to keep the ball low. Um, not, you don't really want to open angles. Whoever opens angles generally gets in trouble. Uh, unless you're very good at opening the angles, uh, don't open it first. Let your part, your opponents do that. Um, I wouldn't lob when there's four players at the net. Low percentage to hit lob volleys. And if you don't execute it, you're going to get drilled. Um, if you're two up, two back, um, the baseliners, I tell the baseliners to think of hitting the ball in the zones. And the zones are the openings, like the alley, the alley, and the middle. Where between the people who are standing and of course the lob you always think two shots ahead in doubles you hit to a zone to open up another zone so if you hit into the alley the players shift now you've opened the other alley if you hit to the middle both players go you open the alleys sure. um, and of course you always can lob push people back off the net um, yeah, and those are the basic formations I mean one, two back against one up one back and all these other ones happen but the, but those are the most common ones are two, one up one back against one up one back and then two up against one up one back and then all four players at the net so if you kind of master high percentage shot selection from those three formations you'll start playing better yeah yeah that's that's uh, a lot of good information what, one 
One thing that I've started to teach people the last couple of years, and I'm interested to hear your thoughts on this, is to really attack the backhand volley a little bit more, especially at the recreational level. So what I notice is most of the errors at the net are from the backhand volley side. So, you know, if we're at two up against two up, you know, you talked about keeping it low towards the middle of the court or even two up against two back targeting that middle the backhand volley back backhand volley yeah absolutely yeah definitely in a 3-0 3-5 level that most um players will have a weaker backhand volley than a forehand volley unless they have two hands sometimes sometimes people with two good 200 backhands that have a 200 volley mm. can have a good backhand volley but if there's a, a backhand volley weakness by all means you want to attack it sure so a couple more questions, then let's get into some rapid fire. So okay. the uh, a lot of questions mm-hmm. I get around the, this three five four level is we try to both get to the net and we just <clears> keep <throat> getting lobbed. What, what do you tell people in that scenario? Um, so I ask uh, first. I want to make sure that they're staggered properly. Okay. Or they're not overclosing. You know, again, a big reason that a big part of the problem with people getting lobbed is that they're closing to the net mm-hmm. on the cross. The cross court person is closing, so they leave, they leave the lob open. Um, you know, the, the position of the of the stagger can be one person in the circle, one person in the service line. If you're anticipating lob, mm-hmm. so it's so if you're getting lob, don't close. Don't get close to the net. And just kind of hold your staggered position with the anticipation of the lob. Um, but yeah, I mean, it is a weapon. The lob is a weapon in the recreational game because overheads are not weak. So if you're constantly getting lobbed, then I say, don't come in. Stay two back. And then if they're at the baseline, then you bring them in. Mm-hmm. You know, like serve, have your service partner be back and have the returners partner be back. So you always want to avoid what is beating you. Sure. So if you're getting beat by it, avoid it and how do you avoid it you if you can't hit overheads then just don't come in yeah yeah just and and then go practice your overheads (laughs) exactly (laughs) okay so um a couple more questions so we've talked a lot about strategy uh i want to kind of transition back to the pro Mm -hmm. tour um singles is obviously far more popular on the pro tour than doubles what is it yep. going to take for doubles to become it, it'll never reach the singles level or at least not anytime soon what is it going to take for doubles to become a little bit more popular uh, at that pro level in your mind um i think it'll tell it'll take the fans speaking out you know and really uh demanding like more coverage uh you know i mean it's interesting because if if you ask most people that are watching you know tennis at a tournament what do they play they play doubles mm-hmm. they don't play singles right so um and you know the uh, networks won't show it yet a couple of years ago they did an experiment where i think it was for the month of october they they played doubles matches they played like all doubles matches mm-hmm. from random you know tournaments in europe and their ratings were through the roof Really? Yet, Who did this? Yes. I, I know it's a little known secret because I actually talked to the WTA about letting me have access to those doubles matches so that so that I could play them. I have a another website called doubles.tv where I, it's where all my um products are, my my all my kind of informational or instructional products. And I wanted to put those matches in there that were commentated. So I would commentate the match for for the viewer, kind of going through what I thought was wrong and right. Um, and they shared that with me and it's like, so then what happened was the broadcasters will not release it because now they think it's valuable, but they, but they won't play it because there's not enough airtime. And it's like, they'd rather play some, you know, 500,000 satellite in the middle of nowhere than play a, you know, quarterfinals of a tier one event, which I don't get. (laughs) Yeah. So, I mean, if you keep complaining to tennis channels, you know, just keep complaining, keep complaining, yeah. keep complaining, and eventually they'll show it more. Yeah, I'm, I'm working on that. I'm trying to bring yeah. the troops and uh, yeah. do that. <laughs> it's hard. This experiment, was it the WTA that did yeah. the doubles thing? Yep, the WTA. Okay. Mm-hmm. 
Interesting. So it's in, I think October of 2018 was when they did it. Yeah. So. Yeah, it would be so easy to set something like that up on Devil's TV or the WTA site right. or whatever. and just. But then it was like, forget it, because then legal got involved and like there's all this broadcasting rights and uh, this and that. So the, the people with the rights wouldn't release them because they then realized that it was valuable. and But then no one really wanted to pay for it. So it, it. Um, right. So it's just sitting in a vault somewhere. That's disappointing to hear. Well, yeah. Hopefully we can change that. Um, cool. So let's let's end with some rapid fire questions. Uh, okay. These are going to be just quick questions. They can be quick or long answers. Uh, okay. What is your favorite tennis book? Oh my God! None. <laughs> none. <laughs> What's no. your favorite non non tennis book then? Ah, uh, darn. Um. You know, I read so much that I, I can't pick one. I have so many. Like every whatever I'm reading Recent at the time, read. Uh, Hillbilly Elegy, Education. Oh, yeah. um, what else? Uh, those two just came to mind. Okay. Oh, right. where the crowd at sing was spectacular. Mm -hmm. I love I love historical fiction. Any historical fiction, I love. Cool. Okay. What is what was your favorite tournament to play? The Australian Open. Australian Open. Who is the toughest opponent you played against? Monica Sellis. Why? Um, she stood three feet inside the service line to return my serve, and in singles, when I played her, it was impossible to get to the net for a first volley. Mm. So she took your time away? Yeah. What is your favorite win of your career? My favorite win... Uh, it's probably a close tie between beating Martina and Pam at the 1988 US Open, which is my first Grand Slam. It was in the semifinals, um, and they were the best team in the world by far. They had just lost a 108-match win streak. And uh, my partner, Robin White, and I were seated, unseated, I think, or seated 15 or something. And we beat them and ended up winning the tournament. So that set up my first Grand Slam win. And the second one... Uh, would be a very close second. The first Olympic gold medal would beat the Spaniards in Spain in front of a packed stadium. It was 12,000 people watching, so it was the biggest crowd I ever played in front of. So that was kind of fun. Nice. Awesome. Uh, and then last question. I might have to change this one. I, I always ask uh, people, what is a tennis story that you've never told anyone? And a lot of people haven't had one. So what's your favorite tennis story maybe? Um, my favorite tennis story, well, since, yeah, but I've told this a lot, but since I was just talking about my favorite match, which is the Olympic um, win in 896, or, yeah, no, 92, rather, 92 Olympics in Barcelona. My favorite story is, you know, Mary Jo and I were playing that match, and we were up 6, 7-3-1. I was serving 30-15, and between my first and my second serve, these two people walk on the court. Literally, I hit my first serve, and I was serving to the outside. And they just walked on the court to take their seats. And their seats were like kind of eye level. So I had to stop, wait for them to take their seats. The whole crowd is like going, Rrr. I thought they were like yelling at them to take their seats. And of course, I proceed to double fault. And I go up to Mary Jo and I go, God, Mary Jo, what are those people doing? She goes, Gigi, calm down. It's the king and the queen of Spain. <laughs> so the king, king and the queen of Spain had this habit of showing up at gold medal matches um, for the Spaniards. And then the Spaniards would elevate their games and come back and win, win gold medals. They've been doing it throughout the games. And sure enough, oh Pachita and Arancha started playing like out of their minds and they won the next six games. We're down two low in the third before we were, we were uh, able to turn, turn around and come back and win in third. Wow. What a mental yeah. like, battle. <laughs> after, I know. After the king and queen come out between serves. I know. So, I was pretty upset about that. <laughs> Well, at least you got the victory. Yes. Awesome. Uh, any other final statements or requests from the audience? Um, well, I mean, I have a lot of good products at doubles.tv or gtranstennis.com. Um, my camps are super fun. They're here in Tampa. Uh, they're three days. Um, we play about 10 hours over three days, cover all the GG method off court. And then we talk about the mental game and uh, I, I've been keeping them really small because of COVID only eight players sure. of the same rating. Um, and they're very popular. Um, 
So if you, if you or your friends ever want to go to a doubles camp, if you travel to, you know, tennis travel to camps, yeah, absolutely. keep that in mind because it's really a fun, fun time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And we'll link yeah. to all of that in the show notes as well. So people can find appreciate it. it. And all right. Up. And uh, thank okay. you. Okay. Really thank you. Thank you. Sorry I was late. Bye. No, you're, you're fine. Bye. Will here with the Tennis Tribe, and thanks for watching that video. If you found that helpful, be sure to click the like button below. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss any future videos. And if you want even more doubles tips and strategies, go to thetennistribe.com and sign up for our weekly doubles newsletter. Every Thursday, I send you a new doubles lesson to help you become a smarter, more effective player. And the last thing you can check out is our podcast. It's called the Doubles Only Tennis Podcast, and you can find it on iTunes, Google Podcast, or wherever you listen to your podcast. In it, we interview ATP and WTA doubles players and coaches. We also have strategy episodes that will help you become an even better doubles player. Thanks again for watching the video, and we'll see you in the next one.